Welcome back to day two of Brasilia. We have started unexpectedly early. <laughs> so welcome back, everyone. On time. Which is to say on time. So uh, once again, coming to you from Rio de Janeiro for the World Congress on Huntington's Disease, I am Ed Wild. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around. I'm Jeff Carroll. Uh, just to remind you, we're here uh, at the end of the day to try and summarize some of what we, we saw at the meeting. Uh, and really importantly, hopefully, uh, record it and put it online and share it with families who couldn't make it all the way to Rio so they can still get a taste of the excitement of this meeting. First, we wanted to briefly reflect on some of today's highlights. Uh, so, Ed, you first. What struck you about the science today? So, for me, uh, my area of research interest is in biomarkers. So, there was a session this morning on biomarkers which really um, uh, caught my attention and it was kind of encouraging, actually. Okay, so, that's the obvious question. What is a biomarker? So there's a lot of debate about this, but the way I think about it is that a biomarker is anything that we can measure that helps us to understand a disease or to develop drugs for a disease. So for instance, um, if you think about blood pressure, that could be considered to be a biomarker for the health of your heart and your circulation. If your blood pressure is up, that can predict heart attacks and strokes. And if you treat to lower the blood pressure, that can reduce the risk of heart attacks and strokes. So that's a really useful biomarker and it's easy to measure. And we're looking for biomarkers for Huntington's disease. We've been looking for a while, and actually we've found quite a few. Um, uh, what we heard today was that those biomarkers are likely to be helpful it would, to support the next generation of clinical trials. We're not going to do away with clinical endpoints, and the crucial thing with any drug is, does it make people better? Does it slow down the progression? Do people feel better? Are their lives improved by this drug? Um, but these biomarkers will hopefully help us to accelerate that program, understand how the drug and the disease are interacting. And what we heard is that over the past decade, we've made huge strides through things like Track HD and Predict HD and a number of other efforts to developing really good biomarkers that will really help with that. So that was cool. And uh, what was your highlight? Uh, so my word of the day was compensation. Ah, okay. So what you need to know, Jeff, is that you cannot sue the hotel because you fell asleep by the pool and got sunburned. Leave my skin out of this. No, this is the idea that a bra as brains are damaged in the course of HD, they remain capable of performing pretty normally. So we heard today from Alexander Durr that even normal people's brains are shrinking as they age. That uh, sounds pretty scary. Yeah, actually. Uh, but Julie Stout from Monash University told us that even in the face of this ongoing shrinkage, brains of HD patients are able to perform the tasks they need to perform to work well uh, quite surprisingly effectively um, through ways that we don't really understand yet, but it seems the brain has an ability to compensate in ways that are really surprising. Okay. So it's that kind of compensation. And that sounds encouraging because that's the sort of thing that hopefully we can work on helping the brain to do better, and that might make a difference. That's right. Stop the insult, and maybe we can make some room for more conversation. Cool. I will never stop the insult. <laughs>
like uh, Eleanor was saying yesterday, that maybe the some types of the some expansion of the Huntington gene protects, or maybe a helpful uh, progression of the human <laughs> being. The monobrow is a genetic advantage if you live in Munster. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I think that's probably the point. Okay. But I've had some very well-meaning friends from the HD scene. I think she's hiding somewhere. One of my good colleagues from Trek, uh, who has, I think, a lot of experience with fashion, because she comes from that kind of city, and she praised it this morning. She actually taught me secretly a few times that I should take better care of this. And I, I actually, you know what? What's very frustrating is I did. So this is actually this is one day's cut. growth. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it was more I'm sorry a, a to few say months it's ago. It's completely reunited, like the uh, like like Germany after World War II. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> So let's. Uh, I can make that disappear. There we go. I can make Actually, them on thank phone. you very much for um, uh, okay, inviting me. Everyone, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Please I, join I, me in thanking Dr. Rylman as he <laughs> retakes it. No, no, no. He's not no. going to sit down after I, a two minute discussion about his monobrow. Come I, on, I, people. I, I want to <laughs> thank you still because I think you just, while we had this nice yoga exercise, you kind of you know, started a new idea in me about a new motor assessment. So oh, okay. thank you very much. Well, we'll yoga be a bit motography. More so you are. A gadget man, right? What's that? You like gadgets, electronic gadgets. Oh, gadgets, gadgets. yes, 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 yes. Very so much. basically what you, what your focus on, uh, one of your main focuses and what you, you spoke about today was what we call quantitative motor assessment. So to my mind, I'm a neurologist and, you know, there are lots of family members in the audience. The movement problems in HD c tend to be fairly obvious. We see unwanted movements and we see people, you know, who have problems with balancing or tripping over pavements. So, but what you're doing is using electronic gadgets yep. to, to measure those problems. Why do we need to do that if the movements seem to be quite obvious? Yeah. Well, I mean, as we have discussed this morning, I think one of the big opportunities we have in Huntington's disease actually is that we could potentially find treatments so er to introduce so early on that we could delay the disease start if we go to what we call today the pre-manifest cohort of gene carriers, which I think is the intention we all have. And um, for that particular purpose, we would need to have very sensitive measurements to judge whether, whether drugs do work in that kind of, in this early stage of uh, Huntington, actually not disease, if you wish, but you know, so early on. And I think it's very important to realize that these motor measurements that we are taking there, if you read the papers from TRAC, um, for instance, um, don't be worried if you're a gene carrier because what we're measuring there doesn't mean, and that's what I wanted to point out this morning, I think it's very important, it's not a symptom, so it's not a deficit, it's not an illness as was pointed out by Carl this morning, and that's very important to know. What we're measuring is really like a, a, a very sensitive fingerprint of something subtle happening, which doesn't affect you at all, but which allows us to potentially say whether a compound X or Y or some vector that is injected in the brain potentially slows down the disease. Okay. And it's not really a biomarker, if you wish. It's really the clinic that we mm. look at, and I think that's the, the good close link. As, as we all know, I think the motor symptoms are not always the most disabling to our patients, but they can be a very nice hint for us to understand whether a drug works. And that's all it's, what it is about. And, and can you give us some examples of the sorts of gadgets that you use to try and <laughs> tease out these very subtle motor things that might help us to understand well, I guess you were thinking of the it. tongue protrusion task, right? The tongue <laughs> so, protrusion task. Well, now we have very simple things, actually. I mean, it's very easy to do. It's like playing with a mouse. So, so we have little force sensors. It's nothing with needles. It's not invasive. And you just touch with your hand. You try to do a regular movement. And we can see very fine, discrete differences between people um, in early stages of Huntington's disease and controls. And we can actually see how these deficits, very fine motor deficits and coordination, do progress over time. So it's very easy. We have a little thing that actually looks like a bottle, if you wish, and it has a force sensor attached to it. So we measure, measure the grip forces that you apply. And we have a sensor attached to it that measures the position of the device. So if you would have Korea, for instance, which um, you know would have some amplitude movement, we could quantify that and we can see whether a drug reduces this or whether it progresses over time, as an example. Okay, Doke. And the other thing you, you talked about today was the, the challenge of recruiting patients 
uh, for Huntington's disease trials. So briefly, if you don't mind, roughly where are we in terms of that? Are we good at recruiting or bad? And what can people do, what can we do as a community to improve recruitment? Well, I think it's quite exciting to review uh, the history of Huntington's disease trials. If you look into trials in the 70s or 80s, they usually had patient numbers of N equals 7 to 10 or 20 maybe at the best. And due to the amazing uh, efforts that were um, you know, put up by people in the Huntington Study Group and uh, now in the European HD Network, I think we have the amazing capability today to actually do clinical trials uh, in a large scale, which means today it's not even impossible to consider to do several trials in parallel that mm. may theoretically require 400 or more patients. I think this is something that 10, 15 years ago wouldn't have been possible to even consider. And I think it's great that the opportunity is here to do this. And it's work of, I think, 30, 40 years of investigators, like I went, mentioned this morning, the Wexler family that started the committee to combat Huntington's disease back in 68, I think. And uh, it's been a couple of decades. And I think it's great to see how this all evolved. And of course, all the patients that we have and their relatives are so amazingly motivated to support this kind of research, which is understandable. And I think it's a, an amazing pleasure for me, for my team, and I guess for all of us here to be part of this, um, I think, kind of scientific, historic um, opportunity we have to maybe stop the first neurodegenerative disease if we have the tools for it. So, but if, if we want to make sure that the forthcoming trials are recruited as quickly as possible, it sounds like we, people need to, in a sense, sign up in advance so that the centers of excellence will know that they exist when it comes to recruiting, right? Yes, I mean, fortunately, uh, we do have uh, the big cohort studies, uh, which in Europe is registry. And then now, um, fortunately, we do have the opportunity to have a worldwide recruiting study and role HD, which, of course, we um, would want to ask anyone who is affected by Huntington's disease or who is a family member to um, add because we even need controls for part of um, the study. So please uh, go and see the next center in your vicinity. And if you don't have one, make Bernhard Landwehrmeier or Joe Giuliani uh, aware <laughs> of it, and uh, you may have one soon. So I think it's a very exciting project that we have that opportunity to um, recruit people globally and then potentially go to um, re clinical trial recruitment in a way which we have never seen in other diseases before. Cool. Thank you, Ralph. Stay seated, but please thank Ralph for help joining us on stage. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Julie Stout. I'm sorry that you were welcomed by another flash of uh, Ralph's monobrow, but welcome to the stage. Please have a seat. So Julie, thanks for joining us. I, I was thinking as you talked today um, that as a, as a scientist and an HD family member, I was, I was struck and I was kind of listening with two brains because you, you study cognition. And so I, I kind of understand as a scientist what that means. And as a family member, um, to me, the worst part of watching my mother get sick with Huntington's disease um, wasn't the movements and stuff as bad as they can be. Um, it, it was the cognition problems. And I realized that patients at home and, and family members might not necessarily know precisely what we mean by cognition. So could you just sort of briefly explain what cognition means and, and like what different kinds of cognition do you study in HD patients? Sure. So cognition is really our thinking um, skills, our ability to remember things and pay attention, um, our ability to make decisions, um, our ability to respond quickly if somebody asks us a question. Those are the kinds of things that we think of that are different types of cognition. And one particular one that's quite interesting and important in Huntington's disease is something we call executive function. This is sort of like a controller type of a function that helps us to you know, think ahead, do planning, strategy, um, to change what we're doing if, if, the, um, if the need arises for us to make a change. So executive function is something that's affected in Huntington's disease that has an impact on lots of different parts of our lives. And that's something that's uh, affected in Huntington's disease. And so have you found that all these different aspects of thinking skills and cognition are equally affected in Huntington's disease? Or are there particular ones that when you talk to patients are, are the most damaging to their quality of life? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's an important thing to realize is that for different people, different patients with Huntington's disease, um, 
they're, you know, they have different courses. So for some people, they might have more problems with their memories. And for other people, they might have more problems with just slowed thinking or not being able to be very, very strategic or make a, make a decision. So it really varies from person to person. But what we do know is that just by and large, you know, for example, Huntington's disease, it looks different than Alzheimer's disease. Um, the kind of memory problem that you have in Huntington's disease is the kind of memory problem where you know something, but you have a bit of trouble remembering and finding it right when you need it. Whereas in Alzheimer's disease, what happens is people really lose their memory for something. That's not really the way it is in Huntington's. They just have trouble getting it back out when they need it. So, you know, Huntington's disease has really some very specific effects. and you know, it, it's going to have an impact on different people's lives differently. I suppose one thing that's important to say is that I think um, a lot of times those difficulties manifest themselves when people have really challenging jobs to do. And an everyday job that's challenging is cooking, okay? When you have to make, you know, say three or four things, and you have to get them all to be ready at the same time so that your family can sit down together, okay? It means you've got to manage, you know, this thing's on the stove and this other thing's in the microwave, and you've got to get the salad going in between starting the microwave. And managing all those kind of tasks at the same time and getting things to come out even at the same time without burning something, this is something that's hard for everyone, okay? But it's actually something that gets quite a lot harder in Huntington's disease, and it can really have an impact on, you know, the ability to function just normally every day. You talked about a, a new a battery of questions you have for HD folks, and I'm struck that, you know, if we want to have drugs or treatments that make cognition better, which I think everyone would, you need to have the right questions to ask, to, for example, about cooking. So can you say a little bit about the new battery of tests you've uh, developed? Yeah. Well, the battery of tests, actually, what it does is it tries to um, test people on all of the different types of abilities that are affected in Huntington's disease. And then it sort of sums it all together. So somebody might have a problem on function A and another person on function B and another person on function C plus D. And if you sum all of that together, then you can get um, a good measure that shows us the impairment that anybody with Huntington's has. But not every person might have the same type of, of problem. So um, that's the kind of strategy we use in that test. And we've tried to take um, the approach of getting pretty broad coverage of all the different types of cognition that are affected. And just as a last question, we've heard a couple of things uh, today and uh, earlier thinking about the idea of environmental enrichment. Now this is mostly animal stuff. But I wonder if you could say a few words about what environmental enrichment is and what it means for people who maybe have an HD mutation. Yeah. Well, we'd really like to know what it means for people who have the HD mutation, and we need to work on getting that answer. And I think that's an answer we can come to in the next sort of five to ten years. Okay? So in animals, and that's what I talked about, we know that in, like, for example, the HD mice, that if you put them in a very enriched environment, you give them, you know, cute little mousy toys to play with, and, you know, they have also um, mouse playmates, and they have mouse exercise wheels, you know, these animals actually, um, it takes longer for their cognition to begin to show the deterioration, for, for it to begin to um, uh, show problems. Now, what we don't know is how that might pan out in humans. And in the animals, one thing that's kind of interesting is that some parts of the brain seem to benefit more from, say, the physical exercise, and some parts of the brain more from um, the, you know, kind of cognitive exercise. So we don't actually know how this is going to pan out in humans. We don't know how much of these um, enriching environments we need, and we don't know which types of enriching environments might be the most important. Um, and so far in humans, the only evidence there is is really just this um, small bit of evidence, I would say, about that if um, a person lives a more passive um, lifestyle, that they may have an earlier age of onset. But that doesn't tell us anything about cognition at all. It just tells us something about the age of onset. So we really need to know more. So the best idea right now, and the best advice anyone can give probably is to stay as active as you can and can yeah, well, I think that's probably a good lesson for everyone. Yeah. And I think, you know, a great thing about environmental enrichment is it's actually never going to have a bad side effect, right? So um, what I sort of think is a promising um, uh, approach to think about in the future is it could be environmental enrichment, maybe, you know, Maybe the part that has, uh, you know, the physical exercise might give you a little bit of like 2% advantage. And, you know, if you have um, the intellectual kind of stimulation, that might give you 3%. Then if you get a good drug on top of that, it might give you another 15%, you know, maybe a little bit more. Who knows? We don't know how all of these things might add up. But I think it's really interesting to think about the possibility of combining different strategies, um, especially some that don't have side effects, and seeing whether we can just get the most out of, um, you know, trying to make the brain work better for a longer period of time. Sounds good. Well, uh, thank you, Julian Rao, for sharing your enthusiasm and uh, for putting up a pen, incidentally. Uh, please join us in thanking them as they leave.
Thank you, guys. Thank you.